Tonight we will hear from the funniest love story of the year. We're invited to a wedding where we will meet Lucy, a former president's daughter. We will meet Ted, Mr. Irresistible, who is believed to be like Jesus except rich and sexy. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll meet Meg, the daughter of a Hollywood legend and an Uber model, who is believed to be the Voldemort of Wynette. She's a lady, Andy, Texas. So, for all of us who want some romance in our lives, we'll hear about it tonight. As, as Mr. Irresistible becomes the Shrooms to Fina Minus Lins. Thank you all for coming. Lucy hat ihre beste Freundin, Mac Coranda, gebeten, anzureisen und ihre Brautjungfer zu sein. Mac kommt und schaut und macht sich so ihre eigenen Gedanken über dieses Traum wahr. Mac attackiert und provoziert Ted Rodin nach allen Regeln der Kunst und erstaunlicherweise lässt Lucy das geschehen, ohne ihren zukünftigen Mann in Schutz zu nehmen. Die Ringe laufen nicht gut für Mac in Wynette. Wer gehört, sie ist bei allen total unbeliebt. Sie kann aber nicht abreisen. Ihr Konto ist überzogen, die Kreditkarte funktioniert nicht mehr. Sie kann auch nicht mehr die Hotelrechnung bezahlen. Das heißt, sie muss ihre Schulden bei der äußerst unangenehmen Hotelbesitzerin Bertie Kittel abarbeiten. Zu einem Minilohn als Zimmermädchen. In einem grünen Polyester, in einer grünen Polyester-Uniform. Nicht sehr attraktiv. Noch unangenehmer ist es aber, dass ihr direkte Vorgesetzte Alice Hoover alles tut, um sie zu demütigen und zu quälen. Zu Beginn von Kapitel 5 ist Meg gerade dabei, eine unförmige, riesige Matratze neu zu beziehen und dazu muss sie die erstmal rumdrehen. Und das beschreibt uns Susan. Meg was struggling to turn the mattress over when she sensed someone behind her. She prepared herself for another confrontation with her boss, Arliss Hoover, only to see Ted Bodine in the doorway. He leaned against the door jam with one shoulder, his ankles crossed, perfectly at home in the kingdom over which he ruled. Sweat glued her mint green polyester maid's dress to her skin, and she dabbed her forehead against her arm. My lucky day, a visit from the local Jesus. Cured any lepers lately? No, too busy with the loaves and fishes. He didn't even smile, bastard. A couple of times this week as she adjusted draperies or wiped off a windowsill with one of the toxic cleaning products the inn insisted on using, she'd spotted him outside. City Hall, it turned out occupied the same building as the police station. This morning, she'd stood in the second floor window and watched him, honest to God, stop traffic to help a little old lady across the street. <laughs> she'd also noticed a lot of young women entering the building through the side door that led directly to the municipal offices. Maybe on city business, more likely monkey business. He nodded toward the mattress. Looks like you could use some help with that. She was exhausted, the mattress was heavy, and she swallowed her cry. Thanks. He looked behind him into the hallway. Nope, don't see anybody. <laughs> Letting herself get tricked like that gave her the willpower to wedge her shoulder under the bottom corner of the mattress and lift it. What do you want, she grunted, checking up on you. One of my duties as mayor is to make sure our vagrant population isn't attacking innocent citizens. She jammed her shoulder further under the mattress and retaliated with the worst thing she could think of. Lucy's been texting me. So far, she hasn't mentioned you. Give her my best regards, he said as casually as if he were referring to a distant cousin. You don't even care where she is, do you? Meg lifted the mattress another few inches. Whether she's all right or not, she could have been kidnapped by terrorists. And I'm sure somebody would have mentioned that she struggled to catch her breath. It seems to us have escaped your supposedly gigantic brain that I'm not responsible for Lucy ditching you. So why make me your personal victim? Well, I have to take out my boundless fury on somebody. 
He recrossed his ankles. You're pathetic. But she barely got the words out of her mouth when she lost her balance and tumbled over the box springs. The mattress slammed on top of her. Cool air slithered over the backs of her thighs. The skirt of her uniform bunched above her hips, giving him an unrestricted view of her bright yellow panties, and possibly the dragon tattooed on her hip. God had punished her for being rude to his perfect creation by turning her into a big mattress sandwich. <laughs> she heard his muffled voice. You all right in there? The mattress didn't move. She squirmed, trying to work herself free and getting no help. Her skirt crept to her waist, putting the image of yellow panties and a dragon tattoo out of her head. She vowed not to let him see her defeated by a mattress. Struggling for air, she curled her toes into the carpet and with one final contortion, pushed the bulky weight onto the floor. Ted gave a low whistle. Damn, that is one heavy son of a bitch. <laughs> she stood up and shut her skirt down. How did you know? He let his gaze drift over her legs and smile. Educated guess. She lunged for the corner of the mattress. Somehow she managed to gather enough strength to turn the awful thing and pull it back onto the box springs. Well done, he said. She pushed a spike of hair out of her eyes. You are a vindictive, cold-blooded psycho. Mm, that's harsh. Am I the only person in the world who sees through your St. Ted routine? Yeah, just about. Look at you. Not even two weeks ago, Lucy was the love of your life. Now you barely seem to remember her name. She kicked the mattress forward a few inches. Time heals, he says. <laughs> Eleven days? He shrugged and wandered across the room to investigate the internet connection. She stomped after him. Stop taking what happened out on me. It wasn't my fault Lucy ran off. Not entirely true, but close enough. 